I have a lot to say, so I'll keep the introduction short. Have you ever heard of Congaree National Park? It's a beautiful res, bordered by a large body of water in the south side of South Carolina. To celebrate completing the senior year of our high school, some friends from school and I decided to go on a camping trip. I wasn't the one who organized it, and I ended up showing up late. When I arrived at the park, I had to wait at one end of a trail until my buddy Harry came and got me. After about an hour of trekking through the woods, we arrived at the campsite. It was a lot cooler than I expected. We were sitting right next to a stream, and we had four large tents between us. There were exactly 14 people there, more than I expected. There were my two close friends, Harry and Tom, and a few I knew from school. There were also three people I didn't know. They were cousins or something like that to the others. So I was fine with it. Anyways, that night we're all camping out, roasting hot dogs over the big fire we got going, when some dude comes stumbling through the bushes. Harry gets up and hugs the guy. Hey, I'm glad you made it. Apparently he was camping with his family who had their RV back on the paved road, and he decided to come up and spend the night with us. We were fine with it because he brought us all some more food and some drinks. He introduced himself as Jeremiah. That's when he starts asking about our friend. He said on his way up he saw some girl off the trail a few feet in the woods. Just sort of standing there. Immediately, we knew something was up. Because there was only three girls with us. And the rest were guys. None of them were gone at any point. So he continued telling his story about the girl. He went up to her and asked if she was part of our group. He then asked if she was sort of slow or something because she just stared at him, slack jawed, with a glazed over look in her eyes. He tried asking her a few more questions, but she never answered. So he just decided, screw it, and continue hiking up the trail. All the while she followed him, only no matter how slow he walked, she was always a little bit behind. He even tried getting her in front of him, but no matter what, she would always fall behind him. Eventually, she disappeared, and he figured she just took a different way up to our camp. Anyways, we were like, no, there's no girl with a slack jaw look up here, man. We were all sort of weirded out. He said she must have been from some other camp, and this made us all relax a little bit. The night wore on slowly because it was midsummer, you know nice and humid. It was around 11 or 12 when we decided to pack it inside the tents. The girls had their own tent and I was with Tom, Harry, and Jeremiah. The rest of the dudes split off into different groups I can't exactly remember. So we're just chilling, goofing around when the sudden smell hits us. It's real nasty. It smelled like somebody was boiling blood. That's how I would describe it. Or like someone was melting pennies. It was strong as hell. First, Harry gets out. And then me. The smell is even worse outside the tents. It clung to the air like whatever was making it was right nearby. Eventually, everyone else came outside of their tents asking, What the hell is that? Covering their noses with their shirts and just complaining about it. One of the girls even started to get a little sick. By now... It's almost pitch black, aside from our flashlights, and we're just like, looking around the camp, trying to see if a deer died or something. The next thing we know is that the smell just suddenly disappears. You know how a smell fades away or gets less? It wasn't like that. The smell was just, gone. It was there one minute, and then missing the next. To this day I never experienced anything like it. So after a bit of confusion and theory crafting that doesn't go anywhere, we all just get back into our tents. Then one dude starts complaining there wasn't enough space inside, telling the other guys to move over. All of us started laughing. Me, Tom, and Harry were close. And Jeremiah was just an easy guy to vibe with. So we found almost everything funny. In hindsight, we probably should have guessed something was wrong by that comment. So I only got a few hours of sleep because I was real tired when I woke up. Like my body just entered deep sleep and got pulled out. 
Then I realized why I was up. Some dude was screaming like mad in the other tent. We get out as soon as we could. And the guy who's yelling is facing towards the woods. All like, in the name of Christ we compel you away. And stuff like that. Jeremiah, who's basically you can say the leader of our little group. Since he brought all of us some beer. Starts talking to the dude. What the hell bro? What's wrong? He turns around. And there are tears streaming down his face. This guy whispered devil words into my ear. He's cursed. He's cursed. He's an emotional wreck. We sort of look at each other and Harry's like, What do you mean? Devil. Words. He said that he was sleeping. And he awoke to one of the other dudes in the tent whispering words into his ear. He said it was in normal language. But just a bunch of sounds that didn't fit together. Then he shoved them. And the dude bolted out of the tent, taking off into the woods. At this point, everyone except for one of the girls was out of the tent listening to his story. We were all creeped out. That's when we noticed that the hot blood smell from before was back. This time, it was a lot weaker, but still strong enough to make you think it was nearby. So we're trying to piece this all together as the dude who told our story is calming down. Each of us only knew a few people, and we couldn't really tell who it was that ran into the woods. We got our flashlight set up shooting up into the air so we had a decent amount of light. That's when Harry brings me aside. Bro, he says, there's 15 of us. At first I nod, before realization kicked in. Our group had 14 people. Then Jeremiah came. So we had 15. If someone ran into the woods, there should only be 14 of us. Real quiet, we asked the guy if any of the dudes here was the one that said the weird stuff. Right away he's like, no, definitely not. And so me and Harry kind of freak out. So we decide to tell the group. They're all confused at first. Then Jeremiah stands up. So you're trying to say when we got into the tents. There was another person with us. Me and Harry both just sort of nod. That's when one of the girls starts crying. She starts going off about how it was the goat man and we were trespassing into his woods. She starts telling us that she went to school with some First Nation kids who told her about the goat man. He gets into groups of people to mess with them. She starts bawling her eyes out so the other girls go to comfort her. I'm just hoping she'll shut up about the damn goat man. One of the other guys starts saying that we should just book it out of here. And Harry's like, no way, not while the sun's still down. Eventually, we agreed to go first thing in the morning. And everyone packed it back into their tents. That night was really weird. Every couple of minutes, you would hear this noise from the woods. Like a laugh. Only, it was inverted. It was a really hard to describe sound. Anyways. We made it to the dawn, so we started to get packed up like we promised. Then, of course, one of the kids started being like, You're not actually serious, right? He thinks we're just playing a joke. Then he starts saying that he wants to stay, and a few other guys are like, Yeah, me too. So me and my boys were kind of split on what to do. The idea of the goat man, or whatever it was, was still there in our minds. All of the girls and the dudes that were in the tent with the one that the goat man had spoken to decided to go. So there was only the four guys and the guys in my tent. Ultimately, we decided we either go or stay as a group. And since it was Tom's friend, we decided to stay another night. We weren't crazy. We didn't want to run into that thing again. So we moved campsites. We trekked back down to where Jeremiah's family was. Real nice folks. We set up our tents about 20 meters away from the RV. We figured whatever it was wouldn't try to mess with us down here, close to other people. With his family in earshot, we began to relax. Just sort of chilling out, drinking, throwing darts, stuff like that. We didn't intend to let the bad night ruin this trip for us, and we were able to forget about it, for the most part. We noticed the smell was back. Very slight, but it was definitely the same copper and blood smell from before. 
It hung around all through sunset. One of Jeremiah's parents came over to our camp asking if we were cooking blood, cause they could smell it too. Eventually, it came time to go to bed. I'm not kidding. As soon as I finished sipping up our tent, the smell just got like 40 times stronger. It was like being hit with a blood-based stink bomb. It was just so rancid, we all climbed out. That's when we saw the damn thing, weaving between the trees outside of the camp. There was just enough light in the sky to make out its figure. It was probably 7 or 8 feet tall. It was so quick, I could barely get a good look and couldn't make out any features. I might have thought it was a person if it wasn't moving so inhumanly fast. We all freaked the fuck out and booked it back towards Jeremiah's RV. We pounded on the door scare out of our minds as the thing jittered and crashed through trees outside of the camp. Jeremiah's dad opened the RV, looking real pissed as we were all flooded into it. Lucky for us, it was a pretty big thing, and all ten of us, the boys, and Jeremiah's parents were able to fit in. What the hell is wrong with you all? Jeremiah's dad was really mad at us and Jeremiah started venting. The goat man, he's out there. The what? Jeremiah was about to reply as there was a loud bang at the door we just locked. It sounded like the door was hit with a metal ram. Like the kind that cops used to bust into places. What the hell? Jeremiah's dad was the only one speaking. We were all terrified including his mom. Jeremiah was hugging her as me and my boys just stood there paralyzed. Then, another bang at the door. This time, it was louder, and it was followed by a voice. Let. Me. In. The words were some of the most unnatural stuff I ever heard. It sounded like, like when you watch those videos of people who taught their pets to speak. Search up a dog talking. It sounded like that. It was so forced. Whatever was out there definitely wasn't human. Seriously. YouTube some of those cats and dogs. That's what it sounded like. Jeremiah's dad knew it was messed up too. As the thing kept banging on the door, he opened up a cabinet above the steering wheel, pulling out a firearm. He primed it before shooting once through the door. What followed was a terrifying scream like a fucking demon. We heard quick footsteps sort of like a horse run away from the campsite and bolt through the undergrowth. Jeremiah's dad then opened up the door stepping out into the clearing and shooting a few more shots in the air. That night we all stayed in the RV. We were all splayed about some of us sleeping on the floor. Jeremiah was in the bed with his mom and his dad was in the driver's seat which he spun around to face us. He promised us he would keep watch as we slept, but we never really got any sleep. We would hear the thing running around outside, breaking branches. I could have sworn I even heard it whispering, Let me in. In different tones. Finally, the sun came out, and with it, all the noise seemed to fade away as well. Even that horrible smell was gone. Jeremiah's dad wouldn't let us out until the sun was fully up. Then he came with me, his son, Harry, and Tom as we went to go pack up our tents. When we got to the tents though, they were ripped to hell. The support rods were all over the place, and the fabric was shredded on both of them. The goat man, or whatever the fuck it was, really hated campers, I guess. Anyways. After we packed all that was undamaged into the camper, Jeremiah's dad told us he would drive us home. The entire drive though, Harry seemed freaked out, and I didn't know why. Near the end of the park, one of the boys I didn't know too well told us that at this point he would get out because he needed to take some ferry or something. I don't really remember what he said. Anyways, strangely, the real quiet kid followed him off. Jeremiah's dad told them both to be safe and drove the rest of us into town. It was only when me and Harry were by ourselves walking home after taking the bus when he told me what freaked them out. We live on the same street so we travel home together. Right as we're pulling up our block he told me that when we had come back from salvaging the tents 
There was another kid with the other group that wasn't there before. The real quiet kid who got off when we were still in the woods. I couldn't believe I didn't notice it. Harry said he was afraid that if he mentioned it, it was most likely going to attack. So he just played it calm. So I'm done writing the story. And yeah, I'm still as confused as you are. I'm not sure what that thing was. The goat man. Some sort of demon. Or something else. I don't think I want to know. Whatever it was. It seemed to have some kind of connection to the woods since it didn't want to leave them. And it took the first opportunity to get off the camper. So I'm going to hope that it belongs to that park. And it won't leave. I'm never going back to that place again. So if you ever decide to take a trip down to the woods. Or to some national park. To go camping or hiking. Or spend a few days out there in the woods. Take my advice. And be careful. If you smell some blood. Pack up and go home. There's some stuff in this world. That we shouldn't. Mess around with. My girlfriend talks in her sleep. She's been saying the most horrible things recently. I'm infatuated with her. And it wasn't at a healthy level. Far from it. I would think about her every moment she was away. I would sometimes sit on my couch and just stare at my phone waiting for her to text. I'll tell myself, don't contact her. Don't. It will come off as too strong. But then I would still find myself clicking her name on my contact list before my inner voice would continue. You don't want her to know how desperate you are for her. It's unattractive. It will scare her off. No. You must wait for her to call you this time. But it was tiring. And exhausting. Almost unbearable. I once heard that the ancient Greeks believed that falling madly. And irrationally in love with somebody was a curse. That you would wish upon your enemies. I could never understand what they meant. After all. Isn't falling head over heels in love the ultimate goal nowadays? But now that it's happened to me, I have to say, the ancient Greeks were right. This is a curse. I was barely in control of myself. Almost as though my infatuation with her had possessed me. The two of us were sexually active together, but still in the dating phase. We were at that make or break era of a blossoming relationship where we would either have the quote unquote talk and formally be in a relationship or we would start to slowly drift apart. The latter of which I don't think I would be able to cope with. Honestly, I wouldn't be able to. Almost everything about her captivated me. The way she held her hand over her mouth when she laughed. How she caressed the pendant of her necklace when she was scared. How she would twirl her hair in her finger when she was excited. All of it. Her smell. Her smile. Her eyes. Yeah, I know. It probably makes you sick reading about it. I feel the same way. I was never the hopeless romantic type. But now, I can't stop fantasizing about her. I would think about us doing the long three hour hike up to that magnificent view from one of our first dates to that first kiss as we overlooked the lights of the city. But this time, I would get down on one knee, bring out the ring, and, well, you know what would happen next. Alright, fine, I'll stop. Yeah, this is a girl I've only been casually dating for a couple of months. I shouldn't even be thinking about proposing yet. I know that. I'm just barely able to control myself any longer. I feel as though I'm losing power over any decisions that I make. And that brings me to why I'm here writing this out at the moment. It started with the first real thing that troubled me about her. We had never actually spent a night together. No matter how late she was over. Once either of us showed signs of being tired, she would up and leave. She wouldn't leave awkwardly or in anger, just a casual kiss goodnight, a smile, and a call me soon. 
It was something I didn't really even notice the first few times she did it. But after almost eight weeks of dating, it was becoming strange. I have to ask her about it. It took drinking almost an entire bottle of wine before I had the courage to do it. She looked almost defeated when I asked and lowered her eyes in embarrassment. I knew this talk would come eventually, she started. She took in a deep breath with a long drawn out exhale. Recently, she paused again. I started talking in my sleep. She shook her head in embarrassment. It's called some niloquy. I looked it up. I shrugged and laughed out loud. My demeanor seemed to say, that's it. No, Stephen, listen, she said. She wasn't laughing. It's bad. It's, it's completely out of control. It's not just random words or gibberish. No, it's horrible. I say horrible, disgusting things. She was starting to raise her voice and started tearing up. I approached her and held her. I told her it couldn't be that bad. I told her to spend the night. I said she was most likely exaggerating. But I was wrong. That night she stayed at my house. But she warned me of something before falling asleep. Whatever you do, don't wake me up. It makes me really scared and confused if that happens. And don't respond to me. Just ignore it. I nodded and agreed. And if it becomes too much, she continued, just leave the room and sleep on the couch. I won't mind. I told her not to worry about it. I told her it wouldn't be a big deal. I told her I wouldn't leave to the couch. That I would stay beside her in bed. But... I was wrong. I couldn't even last one night. We both fell asleep without incident. I'm not sure how many hours passed, but I woke up in the dark with the sensation that someone was watching me. And then I remember, she was with me. She was actually spending the night. I smiled, but then I noticed the shadow outline of her sitting up on the bed. She was looking down at me, staring. It creeped me out, I'll admit it. Her posture was entirely different. It was as though it wasn't even her at all. Then, she spoke. It wasn't her voice that I heard. It was much lower, like something out of a scary movie. I'll chew the skin from your bones, she said. I froze. At first, I just kept looking at her. This was not at all what I expected. I thought it would be more like just random swearing and shouting. I honestly thought to myself, what am I going to do if she attacks me right now? What if she really does try to chew the skin from my bones? But then, she just lied down and went back to sleep. I was creeped out. I tried to lie back down and ignore her, but I struggled. I couldn't even close my eyes without thinking. Maybe she's sitting up again and staring at me. And then one time I rolled over to look at her. And she was. Her face was pressed right towards mine. Her breath was foul and rotted. Something that was not normal for her. She spoke again. In the same voice as before. If you don't move to the couch, you'll be dead by morning. That did it for me. I sat up in a moment and headed for the living room. She made some sort of wheezing sound as I left. I think it was supposed to be her laughing. I was lying on the couch, but I wasn't going to be able to fall back to sleep. I was far too shaken. I was staring out towards the window, hoping to see the first few hints of the sun rising. I thought I heard something from the bedroom. I listened, and then I heard it again. Steven. Steven. It was that same low voice. Steven. I tried to just ignore it at first, but then it continued. Steven. 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 Still, I said nothing. I know you can hear me, Steven. You're awake now. Why don't you come back into the bedroom? The voice barely sounded human. Or maybe 
will prefer if I come to you. I still didn't say anything. I was told not to, but I listened. If I heard her start walking towards the bedroom door, I'm not even joking. I would have run right out of the apartment. But she asked me not to respond to her sleep talking, so I didn't. And then, she spoke once more. Sorry if this spoils your plans. She began laughing. The two of you were supposed to walk that trail again. She started. I wasn't even ready for what she would say next. You would both be so tired when you'll reach the top. You'll look over the city. Then you'll get on one knee and bring out the ring. She began laughing. And that's when I realized that this wasn't just a problem with sleep talking. It was something much more. Something supernatural. I had never told anybody about my proposal. There was simply no way she could have known about any of it. This was no longer about merely talking in one sleep. This was about possession. I can't go back into the bedroom. I have no idea what would happen if I did. Instead, I'm going to wait it out, holding up in my living room until the sun rises. I have a couple more hours yet. I can hear her laughing occasionally in the bedroom. And it's still not her voice. It's still that same low pitch cackle. But as I sit on my couch writing this out, here's what scares me the most. Maybe my infatuation and obsession with her wasn't normal. I said before that I felt like I was losing control of myself. More so I believed in the typical falling in love story. I fear that the infatuation I felt was this thing slowly taking control of me, of it controlling my thoughts, fears, ambitions, and anxiety. Maybe once I become completely absorbed, a transfer would occur and she would be free of it. I know I should leave, that I should open the front door, get in my car, and drive away from here, but I can't leave her. I already lost control. I'm infatuated with her. This happened when I was growing up around 2004 or 2005 when I was about 13 years old. It took place in a good ways outside the town of Uvalde, Texas. The town itself was really small back then, and not much to look at. It's just one of those towns that really isn't on the way to anywhere important. My father knew someone who owned the deer lease that was around a thousand acres, down outside of that area and was complaining about a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land. Being open season on hogs in the south, my dad figured that he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. Not only did this help him with networking for his job, but also gave us some quality father and son time. I remember the drive down from Dallas was torture. It was about seven hours in my dad's hardtop jeep. That car was so uncomfy, I absolutely hated it. The only thing I could do was stare out the window or try and beat Super Mario Land 2 on my Game Boy Pocket. Something I was never able to accomplish when I was younger. The drive obviously took most of the day so we got there in the early evening the owner of the land had told my dad that he didn't have anyone lease it that year yet and the cabin in the property might be a little rough and dusty i didn't really care at this point in my life i had been in scouts for a couple of years and spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends needless to say i was pretty comfortable roughing it out so after unlocking the gate and driving to the cabin on the land we settled in, the cabin was pretty rough, dust and dirt everywhere. I remember that it looked like some raccoons had gotten into the cabin and crapped on the floor. After cleaning up a bit, something about that night was weird. I never was able to get comfortable enough to fall asleep for any restful amount. I couldn't put my finger on why, but I had that feeling that somebody was watching us. I was finally able to drift off for what I guess was an hour maybe. 
When we woke up, it was around 7 a.m. We decided to scout around the land for tracks and signs of hogs and find a good place to set up a blind. It was the summer, and it was very hot in the afternoons, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for about an hour, we came to an area of trees, lightly dense, and luckily found some signs of hogs, typical form of ground where they had been, so we followed them into the trees. I was looking for more signs when my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up and seeing someone standing about 50 yards away. However, some other body was blocked by trees. This was private land so they definitely weren't supposed to be there. We also had confirmation from the owner before we got to the lease that nobody was there. Not to mention, the gate was locked up when we first arrived. The person was wearing some bright colored red jacket. We slowly walked towards them. My dad called out something like, Hey, we're hunting out here. This is private land. The person didn't move at all. Dead still. We were about 30 yards away and could see that he was turned away from us with his hands in his pockets. The weird thing was that the person was in a ski jacket and what looked to be ski pants. Now, this is Texas in the summer. It was about 98 outside by then. My dad called out again. No reaction. He told me to stay behind him and unsnapped the clip to his pistol holster. That's all we had at the time since we were only scouting the area. The rifles were back at the cabin. We approached the person's right side. And then my dad told me to stay put about 20 yards away. I stayed and crouched down. I watched them circle around to the form of the man. All the while talking to him asking if he was okay. He finally passed around to the form of the man. And my dad stood straight up with a confused look on his face. I called out and said, What's wrong? And he called back saying, It's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring at it. And as I got closer, one thing stood out the most. The clothes it was wearing were brand new. No dust, sap, bird droppings, or signs of it being outside for more than one day. At the most. At that moment, I looked at my dad and could see him get worried. Almost immediately after I felt that feeling again, like we were being watched, like somebody was watching us, and I knew my dad was feeling it as well. I wanted to start crying. I remember feeling suddenly so scared. My dad whispered, We're leaving right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol. He scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying to hold back panicked tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was terrified so it felt like an eternity, but it was only about 45 minutes max. After returning we packed up and left. We drove back home that day, and we didn't talk much on the way back. I remember right after we left my dad called his buddy, the owner of the land, and he was confused. He said that he would go check it out next week when he was in the area. He also said that he never had an issue with people because his property was high fence. My dad normally isn't a paranoid person, but me being young, and the least possibly having someone there we didn't know about, he decided to be cautious and just get out of there. After we got back home, we talked, and my dad wasn't able to sleep the night before as well. He had the same feeling but didn't want to wake me up, because he thought I was sleeping too. Turns out that next week, he got a call from his buddy and he checked the whole property and never found any trace of anyone, no mannequin, or anything. This experience still makes my hair stand on end. I have no idea what that was, but the paranoid man in me thinks it was some kind of trap or something. This isn't the creepiest thing that's happened to me in the woods, but it's definitely in my top three. My parents divorced when I was 8 years old. I was upstairs in my room one night with the volume really loud when I thought I heard noises coming from downstairs. I muted the TV and listened closer. Nothing. I resumed playing the game for another hour when I heard the same noise again. Only this time, it was louder. 
I was sure I heard it this time and was a little freaked out. To assure myself, I went downstairs to the basement where I thought I heard the noise coming from. As soon as I opened the basement door, I was hit with a cold breeze. I went downstairs and saw the window wide open. I was 100% sure I had closed and locked all the windows in the house. I was ready to make a run for it when something stopped me. I turned around and for the first time noticed that the closet door was slightly cracked open. I stood for what seemed like 30 minutes in front of that door debating whether I should open it or not. I moved closer and I put my hand on the doorknob. All of a sudden, I heard a creepy crackle coming from inside the closet. I have never run faster up a flight of stairs before. I locked the door and called the cops who surprisingly had a fast response time. They came in and searched the house and not even five minutes into their search. I heard a gunshot from downstairs. A few minutes later, they came out with a crazy looking man most likely homeless. They put him in the back of the car and told me they had opened the door and that the man was holding a gun at them and he actually missed. That's when the cops disarmed him and arrested him. The scariest part was how close I was to opening that door and likely being murdered. I never told this story to anyone and I don't really intend to tell it again. I have a pounding migraine today and this thread has kept me good company as I drifted in and out. I actually don't like talking about this time in my life. When I was around 12, I lived with my mom. We were below the poor level. We lived up in the mountains around Santa Cruz, California. My mom had a friend that owned a large bit of property up there and he let us stay in a trailer up there. Our trailer was very small and was right beside a garden. A chain link fence ran around the garden to keep the dog the owner had out along with other animals. All kinds of deer and things are very common in the area. Also along the fence area was a single room. It was like a tiny house but it was only a single room on the inside. This room had light, and since our actual trailer didn't, I spent a lot of my time in there. By the way, sorry that the story will be fairly long. I'm actually pretty bad at writing. I just wanna say that first, as this will be the only time. So there's this one thing you should know right now. This small fenced in area was only a small part of the property but most of it was just a bunch of woods. Also, I refused to leave the fence area because the owner's dog had been mistreated by children in the past and was very sketchy towards me all the time. If I was alone, it would try to bite at me, even through the fence. The fence was tall, at least seven feet high, and wasn't even movable. So as long as the gate was closed, I was safe. With that being said, there is no one else around us for miles and miles. Now I'm telling you all this because I think it's important that you understand what kind of scene this was before I already get into the story. So we have a fenced in location that seems fairly safe. It contains a trailer and a single room with power that is not connected to the trailer. Nothing else around for miles. My mom's van is parked out in front of the gate to the fenced-in area and a single unpaved road runs from this garden for about a mile to the main house. Now then, I would bring friends up there to sleep over here and there. We all thought it was pretty cool, you know. Besides, we would get our own room to stay in to play video games all night long. It was like a dream come true. The only downside was simple. When it would get dark outside, it would get really dark. No city around and the trailer would not be lit up. There was no bathroom to use in the room and you would have to walk through the dark garden in order to get to the trailer to use it. Strange things would happen out here from time to time. It was always something that could be somewhat easily explained away though. Noises like people working at night or once me and a friend were sitting out in the garden and we saw a shadow as big as a small bear bound up a tree. 
but the tree didn't shake like there was weight on it. The dog also creeped me out, but you know, angry dog, and I was a kid, it happened. Now, I do get scared pretty fast, I always been that way. For example, I have trouble walking through a lit house if I'm alone. My friends, however, tend to be more outgoing, just the kinds of people I get along with. This time, I had a friend over, his name was Jacob. We were staying up all night and playing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 on my Sega Genesis. We started playing as the sun went down and by the time we were finishing up the game, it was around 2 a.m. That's when we heard it. We turned off the game getting ready to find something else to play. There was a rumbling in the woods behind the room we were in, like somebody was rolling something really heavy around. We hadn't heard it before because the noise from what we were playing was loud. I immediately got goosebumps. Jacob was not really worried about it, but it's not like there was someone else's house a yard right over there. It was just a forest for miles, and it sounded like someone was constructing something or some shit, dragging and rolling something really heavy. Eventually, Jacob convinced me to just play some more games. I agreed on the condition that we turned the volume down so we could hear if something happened. We started playing and I didn't even notice that the noise had stopped because I was into the game. A couple hours later, Jacob said he had to use the bathroom. I was feeling fine by then, so I was fine when he left to the trailer to relieve himself. He was taking a while, so eventually, I decided I was going to go check on him. Besides. I could use the bathroom and grab a snack while I was at it. I got up and opened the door to leave. And when I opened it, he was just standing at the doorway, right outside the door, facing it. It scared the shit out of me. That's when I asked what he was doing. And he just stood there, blocking the exit. I realized he must have sneaked up to the door because I could hear him walk away from the room but I hadn't heard him walk back up to it. It was super quiet out there without the noises of the city. I should have been able to hear, but he refused to say anything or respond. He just stood there. I told him he was really creeping me out, but it wasn't like him to try to scare me like this. Finally, I decided to just go to the trailer and use the bathroom myself. I told him what I was going to do. Then I moved past him. But when I pushed him out of my way a little, his skin felt freezing to the touch. I jumped a little, but it was a cold night and he had been standing out there for like 30 minutes. So I figured that was to be expected. I walked as quickly as I could over to the trailer and... That's when he followed me, like, right on my tail. It was unnerving. I joked a little, saying that he already surprised me by scaring me at the door. The joke is over already. Finally, I got to the trailer and walked in. He didn't follow. He just stayed at the doorway. Now, I want you to picture this. Imagine inside a trailer with the door open in the middle of the night and your friend is just standing outside a trailer looking in. I checked on my mom who was fast asleep. Then I turned to go into the bathroom. It was a portal potty and we keep the bathroom door shut because it smells bad. When I reached for the door and tried to open it though, it was locked. That's when I heard a nervous voice come from behind the door. Um, in here. I quickly turned to look at Jacob, but the door was still open and there was nothing there but pitch black night. I froze. I would have heard the bathroom door open if he had come in behind me and gone that way. There is no way to do it quietly. That's when I just yelled out so loud that my mom woke up. I stared at the doorway, unable to bring myself to move a muscle. She got up, walked over there, and looked out. Not seeing anything, she closed the door and asked me what was wrong. 
By now, Jacob was coming out of the bathroom and acting perfectly normal, but just a little bit confused. I explained what happened, and Jacob said he was just taking a long time in the bathroom, basically. None of them believed me at all, no matter how much I insist. My mom is sure that I just got sleepy and imagined it. And Jacob thought I was trying to prank him. So my mom gets out a big flashlight and walks us back to the room. She tells us to go to sleep. Then she leaves and goes back to the bed herself. Now, this room doesn't have any windows or anything. So after a while, I calm back down a little bit. I'm telling myself that my mom was right. It must have been like a waking dream or something. Meanwhile, Jacob insists that he was in the bathroom the whole time, and I'm inclined to believe him, because there is just no way to really get around without being heard. So I settled down, but I'm a little rattled, but I'm thinking that I can just sleep it off throughout the night. Suddenly, the dog starts going nuts, right behind us. The room is up against the fence. So the dog must have been like right behind the room on the other side. I guess when the dog started going nuts I got scared because Jacob started laughing at me and said the dog barking at a squirrel or some shit and you're over here shitting yourself. It keeps going like that for a long time though. Suddenly the barking stops and gets replaced by whimpering. We hear the dog run away. There's about 45 seconds of silence before we hear something new. A small stretching sound on the back wall of the room. We both try to be silent as we can. Eventually, it stops. After five or so minutes of silence, Jacob decides to be brave. He decides that he's going to wake up my mom to tell her something crazy is going on. I wish he wouldn't leave me alone but there's absolutely no way I'm gonna go out there. He arms himself as best as he can with a tennis racket we had in the room with us. Then he takes a couple small steps and opens the door and dashes out. I close it as quick as I can behind him. In less than 30 seconds, I hear a scream. Not long after, the door flies open and he comes back in looking pale as a ghost. He looks tired and his breathing is like he just ran a marathon. His eyes look as big as dinner plates. I then ask what is going on like four times before he finally starts getting words out. He tells me he walked out there and he was walking through the garden as quick as he could and then he saw my mom just standing there. He tried to talk to her but she stared at him with a blank expression getting super creeped out because of what happened to me earlier. He took a couple more steps towards her telling her that he thought something was in the woods. Suddenly, her face turned to an awkward smile. Then he realized something terrible. He hadn't noticed sooner because of the darkness. She was on the other side of the fence. Now, the door to this room does not lock. And as I explained earlier, this room had no windows. As he is telling me what happened, he is also at the same time putting stuff in front of the door. And by the end, I was helping him. In retrospect, whatever was harassing us seemed to not want to actually enter the room or the trailer. Because the Jacob one didn't come into the room or to the trailer itself. Either way, we stacked everything we could against the door, thinking somehow, like in cartoons, this would actually definitely keep the creature out. So for the rest of the night, we heard scratches coming from all around the room. I, of course, ended up crying. Jacob looked like his mind had left his body with fear. At one point, whatever was out there was speaking as well. I heard it from right next to me where I was resting against the wall in my mother's low voice. The same exact phrasing she had used earlier in the night. What's, What's wrong? wrong? Followed by, go to sleep. The sun must have come up eventually. The scratching as well stopped. We heard my mom come to get us 
This time, we actually heard footsteps. We, of course, refused to leave the room. My mom had to go get the property owner and have him take the door off. When we saw that it was actually her, I burst into tears again. We never had any experiences like these again, and we eventually moved away. But that one night still haunts me. I still refuse to go out at night unless I'm with a bunch of people, and I will never, ever live in the woods again. Anyways, I hope you all enjoy hearing about this, as I probably won't tell the story again. Thanks for listening. When I was 23, I had a security gig at a dairy farm in Ohio. It was a modest place, only holding a few dozen cows at any given time. My then co-worker, a 34-year-old recovering meth addict named Corey, had just been fired for letting a cow go missing on his watch. An offense that would get you fired in every sense of the word. For starters, Corey was insane. By the time we met, he was seriously addicted to all kinds of drugs, and it rendered him virtually schizophrenic. Long nights were spent with him during my training period. He would tell me about the CIA and how they were out to get him. He was convinced that they were broadcasting thoughts into his head and that they would stop at nothing to ruin his life. More than once, I would catch him glancing over his shoulder or peeking out of windows with a dumb look on his face, hoping to catch a glimpse of whoever was following him. That's the type of person that Corey was. Each of our cows had an ear tag labeled with a number. At 8 p.m., they were each to be guided into their own respective stalls and locked in for the night. Padlocks became the norm after an incident with local kids a few years earlier. In the mornings, we would have to carry around a clipboard containing each lock combination and individually release each one. It was the most annoying way to start the day, but the cows were more secure that way. That's what made Corey's story so unbelievable. He had claimed that the previous night, cow number 29 had been locked away in her stall along with the others. He told us that the only thing out of the ordinary that night was a bat stuck in the rafters that he planned to deal with in the morning. In order for his claim to be true, an intruder would have unlocked the barn with a set of keys, unlocked 29th stall with the correct combination, then reset the locks and leave undetected. Either that, or they picked up a 1600 pound animal and leaped through a window. Considering Corey's nasty habit of abandoning his duties in order to twitch and hallucinate in the corner, a small part of me believed that some two-bit thief might have been able to get one over him. My boss, however, a 50-year-old hothead, concluded that Corey must have been involved with the cow's disappearance and kicked them to the curb. With nobody else to fill his position, my boss had offered to pay me extra for each of his duties that I could complete until we received a new hire. Naturally, I agreed. I would be heading back to school in a few weeks and needed all the money I could get. My first night back at work began normally. Since I would now be doing the work of two security guards, I would arrive early to get a head start on Corey's checklist. I started out by sweeping out the barn. Farmhands try to keep the TMR in a long pile just in front of the stall door so the cows could eat throughout the night, but that shit practically painted the floor by the time I got there. Midway through, I noticed something reflective in the corner of the barn. I swept a loose bit of corn and hay over it to investigate. On the floor before me was a neon yellow ear tag, and I picked it up to examine it. 29. Next to 29's ear tag, were the skeletal remains of a bat. I guess that was just another thing that Corey never got around to dealing with. I swept up the bones along with the rest of the barn. By the time I finished, it was already 8 p.m. I made my way out to the fields, and one at a time, I guided each cow to its assigned stall. I got through about 10 or so before I noticed something strange. Across the field, 
about 50 meters away from everything else and all the others was a cow alone. It faced away from me, seemingly transfixed on a nearby cornfield. Seeing a cow on its own is nothing strange, as they sometimes need personal space the same way as people do. What was strange though was the way that her tail stuck straight out from behind her, unwavering. She stood as if she were afraid to slip, with her feet planted far apart. Perhaps the strangest of all, her head appeared to be tilted at a 90 degree angle. I wasn't eager to tell my boss. They had already put down so many sick cows before, but losing two in the matter of a week might have been enough to send them over the edge. That's when I decided to save that cow for last, as I continued to guide the rest of them inside for the night. Being in charge of twice the amount of cows I was used to was time consuming. It took me nearly an hour to round them up. By the time I locked number 36 for the night, it was 9 o'clock. I should have been making my rounds by then, especially given the circumstances. I just had that last cow to deal with. When contemplating how long it was going to take me to unlock each cow in the morning, I realized something that made my blood run cold. The only stall left empty was number 29. I shuffled to the field, and surely enough, she was there. She hadn't moved an inch since I started the process of moving them. I approached her slowly. It was surreal seeing a creature frozen in such an odd position. As I came up on her, I could hear a definite, but muffled, chittering. It was unlike any noise I had ever heard from a cow. What the fuck did you eat? I thought to myself. I whistled to the cow before approaching her to avoid scaring her. On a dime, the chittering ceased. The cow's left ear rose to face the sky and began to oscillate like the periscope of a submarine. I could tell that moving this one would be a challenge. I rubbed her back attempting to calm her down. Bonding is key when establishing any sort of relationship with an animal. I had never interacted with 29 before, so we were unfamiliar with each other. Her skin felt bizarre, like clay with hide draped over it. I walked around to see her face. Her eyes were peeled open, darting around. Her mouth hung open and drooped to the side. I examined her left ear searching for a place to reinsert her tag, but there was no piercing. I strapped the halter to 29's mouth and began to lead her. It was like trying to uproot a tree with a bike chain. Each tug that I gave was useless. I began to put my weight into it, but still, no luck. When I say no luck, I don't mean that 29 wouldn't follow me. I mean that her body shows zero sign of being affected by my body weight whatsoever. Cows are strong creatures, but they're not made of stone. I was perplexed. After 15 minutes of this, I decided that it was useless to continue on, with the clock ever ticking. I could no longer afford to neglect my rounds. I began to walk to the security post to collect my flashlight and get on with the night. I heard a slow trotting. I looked behind me, to see that the cow had in fact moved. 29 was now facing me. Not so shy now, I wonder. I turned around and continued walking towards the gate. When I made it halfway through the field, I began to hear the trotting again. But this time, it was louder and much quicker. I smiled to myself. Wish I would have known to walk away sooner. Without turning to face the cow, I walked into the barn and began fumbling with 29's padlock. 3 left, 32 right, 23 left. As the lock clicked open, I heard the floorboards behind me creak. A slow, vocal noise turned to a sickly gurgle. I hope to God whatever you got isn't contagious, I said before spinning around. All color drained from my face as I was greeted with the sight of the 8 foot tall beast standing before me on its hind legs. Its ears were flapping like a hummingbird's wings. Its head was cocked sideways with one eye focused on me. Its pupils seemed to grow and shrink as it scanned over my entire body. 
Its lower jaw slowly moved up and down as it began to vocalize again. It began to creep towards me. Its front legs were kicking as it attempted to keep balance, all the while making that same noise. I began to feel lightheaded. I grabbed 29's padlock and made a break for the door. That's when the cow began to stomp behind me. I began to hyperventilate as I sprinted. The rest of the cows were spooked, shaking and jumping around as well. I slammed the door shut and clasped the padlock. A sickening boom shook the entire wall of the barn as 29 began to claw at the door. Oh, oh, oh. The beast croaked before chittering once more. I backed away from the door slowly, its wooden frame bending and contorting at the sheer force behind it. Without another warning, I turned my back to the barn and ran to my car as 29 began wailing and pounding. I never ended up making any rounds that night. Instead, I started my car and left that fucking place in the rear view mirror. I didn't even tell my boss. In fact, I avoided several of his phone calls because I had nothing to say. I figured it would be best if I just quit the easy way. There are certain things in life that back you into corners. Silence forces your hand, you know. That's why I'm writing this now. I still wanted my money. A few weeks later, just before making my two hour drive back to college, I stopped by the farm to pick up my final check. My boss wasn't in his office on Tuesdays, so I took advantage of the situation and granted myself access with the key that I had seen him kick under the rug once or twice. After snagging my check and a few Jolly Ranchers, I got in my car and slowly began to drive away. Out of the corner of my eye, a young farmhand standing in the grazing field caught my attention. I lowered my window and said, Hey kid, stay away from the night shift. But he didn't answer me, nor even look at me. He just continued to stare at the pile of bones before him. As I kept driving, I kept staring at him, and he wouldn't even move an inch. That's when something struck me as odd. His head was tilted sideways, similar to 29's head. I swear, I'm never going back to that farm again. For a few months, I've been having a feral cat that comes to my back porch looking for food. I first saw him in October around 6 p.m. when the sun was going down and I had walked to the back door to take a smoke outside. I could see him through the double window that looks out onto the swamp beyond. He was sitting patiently as if he had been waiting for me. His black greasy fur reflecting the colors of the sun. When he saw me approaching, he stepped closer to the window and stood on his two back legs and started to paw wildly at the window. I chuckled and walked back to my fridge, pulling out some leftover chicken breast from the night before. I grabbed an old plastic dish from the cabinet and I tore the chicken apart into bite sized pieces. I returned to the back door. I opened it only enough for me to squeeze out so that he wouldn't bolt into the house. If he did, I knew I would regret it, letting him slip inside, only to possibly infest my home with blood-sucking fleas and to tear up my furniture. I placed the dish down, and he pranced towards it, scarfing it down like it was his first meal in weeks. I looked at him closer, through his long fur, and could see how thin he was. His legs looked like skin and bone, and his cheeks looked sunk in, causing his eyes to protrude out grossly. It was then that I noticed his tar-colored eyes that had no glint to them, 
no shine from the setting sun. It reminded me of those computer screens that don't reflect pesky sunlight glare coming from your window. I felt uneasy, worried now that he may attack me. However, he looked at me once and blinked slowly before racing down the porch stairs and disappearing into the wooded swamp. I started to wake up every morning only to see the dead corpse of some poor animal when I would take my routinely first smoke of the day. It started with little animals, birds, mice, and other small rodents. I always figured it was just the way that cat was thanking me for feeding him when he came, which was only a couple of times a week. Even though I only saw him a few times, there was always a dead animal on the porch step every morning. I thought it was silly that some old cat would bring me presents every morning. After about a month, the corpses began to get bigger. I was finding more bigger rats and the occasional possum. I started to think it was strange that this cat seemed to catch his dinner just fine but still came to me for scraps. I always brushed it off though seeing as it wasn't doing me any harm and I had no roommates who may have been disturbed by it. However, on one particular cold and foggy morning, I walked to the back deck to have my cigarette and I looked down to look for my present. There was nothing there. I could feel my heart flutter. I was worried that something may have happened to my little buddy. That feeling quickly left and I felt my stomach drop as I looked over the railing to see my lawn filled with bodies. I placed a hand over my mouth to catch my gasp. The sight was disgusting and a less than pleasant encounter when all I wanted was to enjoy a smoke. After that occurrence, the dead animal started to appear once again on the back deck. Part of me felt relieved that my cat was okay, while the other part of me felt like something was terribly off. Sometime in January, I woke up in the middle of the night, groggy as hell, but with a strong craving to have a smoke. I walked down the hall and paused at the window overlooking the backyard, and I saw a pale figure that reflected the moonlight. I paused and my eyes widened. Suddenly, I was no longer groggy and the urge to smoke disappeared. The figure looked up at me and I froze. My breathing stopped. I could see its sunken in eyes staring at me and its spine protruding from its pale skin that had patches of fur peppered. It looked very strange, almost human-like, hunched over while standing on two legs. I panicked and I could feel my body growing hot as my heart beat quickened. After staring at me a little longer, it turned around to crawl over the fence and then it walked away on its two legs. I went back to bed, completely terrified. I woke up the next morning and rubbed my eyes, releasing a big yawn. I thought to myself, what a crazy dream I had. I got up from bed and walked downstairs to make myself a pot of French pressed coffee. I grabbed my pack of smokes and my mug and walked out the back door. I walked to the rail with my mug and crossed my arms and leaned over. 
I instantly dropped my mug and could hear it shatter on the concrete below. Time felt like it had slowed as I looked around to see corpses lacerated and splayed across my yard. The black feral cat was strategically in the middle of all the dead bodies. No mercy was spared to any of those animals. I felt my stomach heave and I threw up what was left of my dinner from last night. I felt a chill run down my spine as I remembered what I had seen the night before and I no longer believed it was a dream. I quickly walked back to the door and locked it shut behind me. It felt surreal and I couldn't imagine that this was happening to me, but to my dismay, it was. I couldn't be bothered to clean all the bodies. I was too fearful to walk out that door. I stayed inside the house for the rest of the day on my computer, looking for solutions to my problem. Of course, I found nothing but nonsense about some beings called rakes, wendigos, and skinwalkers. I strongly felt that this was some person playing a massive prank on me, and I desperately wanted to believe that was the case. I fell asleep at the table in front of the back door. Being the light sleeper that I am, I woke up to a gentle but loud knock at the door, followed by a few more. I immediately sprang up and swiveled around. I pulled the blinds away from the door just enough to peer out the window. Nothing. I walked to the window beside the door and shrieked at what I saw before me. The creature I had just seen the night before had pressed its hands and face against the window and was breathing heavily with a wicked smile plastered against its face. I ran to the counter and snatched my keys, running out the front door to dash to my car. As I got in, I began backing out. That's when I saw the creature come around the side of the house, only to stop when it saw me backing away. It then stood up on its two legs and gave me a slow wave, showing off its nasty pointed teeth and its disgusting smile. I retreated to my sister's home, which was about 30 minutes away, and I busted through the front door with no explanation. She came running down the stairs with her boyfriend following close behind her. She flicked the lights on and could see how disturbed I looked. Taking me to the guest room downstairs, she told me I was welcome to stay as long as I needed. After refusing to tell her what went wrong, I felt crazy after what I saw. Part of me still believing it wasn't real and another part afraid she would think I was crazy. A few days passed and I was beginning to feel more at ease. My sister was making breakfast by the time I woke up and I nodded to her and her boyfriend as I sat down at the table when there was a ring at the doorbell. I went to go see who was there as I saw my sister was busy and her boyfriend was enjoying a little small talk with her. I opened the door and was surprised to see no one was there. A putrid smell struck my nostrils. I looked down to see the half rotten body of my feral cat.
skinwalkers. Yeah, I grew up on the reservation. And we just follow little rules at night to keep ourselves safe. They are real. 100%. My entire family has seen them. I have many native friends who have family members that are actually part of the skinwalker community. I mean, I don't know how else to phrase it. Some of these rules are no whistling at night. Don't say the name out loud. Don't leave windows open on a full moon. One time we had one claw and cry at the side of our house on a full moon. So this is a personal rule that not many other people follow. We also have restricted places we can go at night because they are Navajo worshiping grounds. And for anybody who isn't Navajo, there are places you cannot visit legally because of skinwalkers, religious practices, and sacred land masses. I do want to point out that, as a side note, most of the time they just look like normal people. They're not what the media makes them out to be. There are some non-native families living in our small town, and skinwalkers are just a normal part of their life. My mother actually cared for one in the nursing home who didn't fully transition, and there were rules that she had to follow. Some of them are smearing ash on their foreheads before entering the skinwalker's room, saying a Navajo sacred prayer, and never entering alone. There's also a few wild stories from her experience when it comes to physically caring for one, but it may be too long to add here. Now, most of them look like humans, but when it's not, it's a funky long creature that can take the form of anything with one abnormal thing attached to it, like a goat with seven legs or a dog without a nose. They want that flesh of yours. So here are more extra tips to survive them. Living in the reservation is like playing a game of what the hell was that noise every night. If someone begins to smell like their flesh is rotting, run. If someone wants to take you to the reservation, politely say no and just move to another city. Don't ever come back and pray. Pray to whoever you believe in. If you're not religious, Pray to a random god, to anybody that comes to mind. Skinwalkers are demonic creatures. But if you're ever in the woods and you hear some whistling, this is a calling sign that the skinwalker is coming after you. Last Monday, I went on a walk into the woods. I go all the time, whether it's spring or winter. I'm 18 years old, I'm not very tall, and I don't weigh much. So I'm a pretty fast runner too. Sometimes, it can get really creepy out there in the woods. My mom and grandparents, they live right down the road by the way, always told me that if I start to feel unsafe out there, I always need to leave. They never said why, but I always figured they were afraid of the koi dogs, and it never seemed that important. I did listen to them though. So Monday afternoon, maybe a bit past 4 o'clock, I left to go walking. I had been out there just two days before with no issues, but after walking for about half a mile, the feeling that I was being watched began. I kept walking until I came to the old logging road. It makes for a quick way around the woods, and it also connects to the road that my house and my grandparents' house are on. I was getting pretty tired of hiking through the snow-covered bushes and logs. I still felt like something was watching me, and just a few moments before, I could have swore I saw something moving around from the corner of my eye. So I decided to walk down the logging road instead. As I was walking down it, I heard the sound of chains rattling nearby and started looking around for them. I was thinking maybe it was just chains in a tree blowing in the wind, but I couldn't find any chains, and I stopped hearing it after a second. I kept walking and was getting close to my grandparents' land when I heard the chains again. 
I stopped walking to look around me and to check to see if maybe it was something I was wearing. My jacket, my necklace, but it wasn't anything on me. I jumped around to double check and maybe looked really stupid, but I knew it wasn't me making the noise. I decided just to go to my grandparents' house and walk back using the actual road. But as soon as I started heading into the woods, I heard something. It sounded like my own footsteps had been in time with a second pair that were maybe about 10 feet away, which made no sense because there had been nothing there just a moment ago. I took another step and heard something step at the same time from behind me. I didn't turn around. I was too afraid. So I acted as if I was going to take another step, but I stopped my foot right above the snow. I wanted to make sure I wasn't going crazy. Behind me, whatever there was, stepped down. I heard the snow crunch, then it moved forward again, quickly. It must have known I figured out it was there. That's when I started running towards my grandparents' land, and whatever was behind me followed. It sounded humanish, and the sound of the chain started up again when it started chasing me. The thing definitely had only two legs, and it sounded pretty big. There's a lot of thorn bushes, small trees, and other things that stay around all year, even in the winter. When I ran between them as best as I could, it was just going right through them. I glanced behind me for a second, and all I saw was... A really tall, gray, humanoid blur before I looked back in front of me. The final stretch was terrifying. I could hear heavy breathing and chains rattling just a few feet behind me the entire time. And it sounded like it was almost growling. My grandparents' dog was up in the yard near the house and started barking. But he didn't run towards me. He just stayed by the house barking. Then he ran with me to the house when I got close to him. I ran up the door and went inside. The dog came in right beside me and I slammed the door shut. I didn't hear anything and I looked out the window but there wasn't anything there. The dog was leaning onto me and shaking. My grandfather came to the door from upstairs after just a few seconds and I started crying and told him everything. He became very serious and told me, Don't think about it. Just forget it ever happened. I tried to ask him why, but he refused to tell me anything. I tried asking my grandmother too, but she didn't say anything. And she changed the subject. Before I begin... I would like to say that this is a very long story. It's been something that's haunted me since I was six years old. Since my first encounter with it, I had dreams about this and two very specific encounters with the creature. I'm sharing this story so I could possibly find help on what to do or how to get rid of this creature that's been hunting me since I can remember. Just for background, I'm a 21 year old female and still worry about this creature finding me, but I'll get into detail why later. For now, here's my story. I would always go camping with my grandparents, who I call my Gammy and Gampy at the end of my school years. I would always look forward to it since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping. Loving the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course, the wildlife that we would see. Now, I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest was like my true home to me. I always prefer being near trees and dirt instead of buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were more quiet and more peaceful. I always felt safe when I was there, like nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this reoccurring dream during 
the last week of my school year. I would be in the woods, walking alone, down a dirt trail. The woods were always quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human-like, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes. And it would always just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me. Usually, in my dream, I would go up and pet it, making the fox finally make a noise, mostly a soft growl. Then I would continue walking, and it would follow me. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five years old, and it lasted until I was about 11. As the years went by, it would be the same exact thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, then continue on with my hike with it alongside me. But when I was having the same dream on the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel uneasy about this fox. I could hear it making odd noises, but every time I went back to look, it was just walking like nothing was wrong, even somehow giving me a smile. Sorry to go on about a dream, but I now believe that this was a warning of the creature. Now that the dream is out the way, I can talk about my first true encounter. I was six years old and I was going on a camping trip with my gammy and gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited I was barely able to keep myself in school for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and already had the camping trailer attached to my Gampy's truck. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats with me being always in the middle. It took about two hours to get there and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. It was deep into the woods and far from other people, as my gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we were camping. As they were setting up the camping trailer, I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig, but I noticed how quiet the woods were. It was never quiet, not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it. As I continued to dig for bugs, however, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would always call me Sugar Booger. That being a nickname she gave me since I was born. That's what I had heard. But it sounded like she was very far away and somewhat sick. Sugar Booger. I looked up where I heard it coming from which was from the woods, but there was no way she was there because she was still unloading stuff from the truck. Even at the age of six, it didn't feel right. So I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about this weird encounter I had as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day, we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars. There was never any where I lived at. We started to get sleepy around 9 p.m., I believe, and we started to get ready for bed. There were bunk beds that me and my gammy would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk, and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my gampy snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer I would always sleep next to the trailer window just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though, that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up maybe hours later, it was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up late in the night since I always had sleeping issues. I rolled onto my side trying to fall back asleep until I heard sugar sugar. my eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken but I knew 
it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep, and they were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut, like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six, I knew this wasn't normal. Then, I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft, but loud enough for me to hear it. I just sat there, frozen in fear. I was trying to just brush it off as tree branches or rain, but I just knew it wasn't it. I could tell it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then I decided to be brave and look. Big mistake. I pulled the curtain away to only peek and all I saw were these large yellow eyes. They seemed glassy yet not real. They looked like giant teddy bear eyes but cold and unwelcoming. I remember in that moment I panicked and quickly closed the curtain back up. I then hid under the blanket, that being the only thing I knew to do when I saw a monster. I could feel tears falling down my face. I never had been so terrified in my life. I just curled up into my gammy side and clung to her all night long. That damn tapping, only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did. I do remember my gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I got up quick enough, we could still go fishing, but I didn't want to leave the trailer at all. Terrified that whatever I saw the night before would still be out there. I did eventually go outside, but I was just looking around, horrified that whatever saw me last night would get me. My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug when she saw me, asking me what was wrong. I did tell her what I saw and heard, and to my surprise, she believed me. The next thing I know, she was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a bit to convince him, but he did eventually start to pack up and hook the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so I could fall asleep but I just couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched, thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw, that if I closed my eyes even for a second, it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far from me when I heard it again, but this time it was my actual name, Aaliyah. In that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. She looked up into the bushes where we heard it, then to me. She then got in the truck with me and pulled me into a tight, protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go back home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well. And since I was crying so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed we could go home. We started to head out the campsite, still hurt that this trip had been ruined by something but I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did, feeling an ice cold fear wash over me as I saw something, a red fox, sitting in the middle of the campsite, sitting there with large yellow eyes, the same red fox from my dream, somehow curling its lips into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to that campsite. We did continue to camp, but in more populated areas. I never told my grandma what I saw, but she had told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities, and that would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of the story, but I'm afraid it isn't. There was one more encounter I had with the creature, and it was much more terrifying than the first time. The second encounter I had was when I was 17, many years later. By this time, I knew very well what a skinwalker was now, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas. I still worried about seeing that
Fox, but I never really thought about it too much. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas. Them living way up into a mountain area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there was no service at all. So unless we hooked up into their Wi-Fi, we had no phone. I didn't mind the house. I was still loving the woods, no matter what happened. Even though at night, I hated how they didn't close the window curtains, making it easy for anything outside to see inside. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything hurt us. Lucky for all of us, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could go outside and run around. They also had this beautiful black lab. She was about a year old. Her name was Pam. She was very playful and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Even though I'm a girl, I wanted to go hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was a really chilly morning, but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam. It was a good way for her to get some exercise and have fun. About maybe an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit, wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful, I could have stayed there. But as we continued to walk, I started to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had become. Hearing only footsteps and my brother talking to our uncle, Pam, noticed it too. Her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get next to my brother. I was worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby, but I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though. Even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. My little brother was only nine at that time, and being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pam, who was now next to me and still growling. I began to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold fear I once felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I could worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six year old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though, seeing my shoelace came undone. I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. And that's when I heard it. Aaliyah. In that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach. My eyes were widened and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head and there it was. That same red fox still having those horrid yellow eyes and that same demented smile. Only this time I saw it much more clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting. The smell it had was like rotten, decaying flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were much too long for a normal fox. The back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it. But now they looked emptier than I had remembered. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I just couldn't. I was frozen as I was too scared to even blink. Then I heard it speak again. This time, however, it had mimicked my little brother's voice. Found you. Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, who didn't see what I saw, as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a song under his breath, keeping my brother and myself close to him. 
I was just too scared to even look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up, saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused since we talked about that hike for days. On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that thing was after me and she was protecting me. I was very grateful that she was with us. Who knows what would happen if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I was talked to by my uncle and aunt. I told them what happened and what I saw. And then they started to pray and check that all the locks were shut tight. My aunt started putting something around the doors. I now believe it was most likely ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short as they were worried that I was not safe while still in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day. They made an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they had to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I did leave the woods, I truly felt safe again. Before they had to drive back home though, they told me that it wasn't my fault and that lucky for all of us, it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. It was still around. How? Why? What did it want from me? Does it want my skin? My soul? Was I just going to be tormented by this thing forever? I still don't have answers to these questions, and that's what really scares me. Now, I have long moved from California, and now live in Kentucky. I do live in the woods, but so far, that thing hasn't found me. I know that seems very stupid on my part, but life had changed a lot when I was growing up. I was given no other option to live somewhere else, and my grandpa in Kentucky was kind enough to let me live with him. So please don't call me an idiot for moving to the woods when I had no other choice. Anyways, I am happy it hasn't found me, but I'm still worried. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who knows truly on how to get rid of this thing. And that's why I'm telling my story now so I can possibly find help. So please, if there's anyone out there who does know, please help me. When I was 13, I was on an ATV with my two older sisters, one 15 and the other 18. We were going to my grandma's place, which was less than two kilometers away from my parents' place. We were traveling through our fields, but on the way, I suggested we go around the fence so we didn't have to open the gates. It was pretty much the same road, just a bit off to the side. As we get to the middle of the field, we all noticed something sitting on top of the hill we were about to climb. We slowed to a crawl because it looked human. We thought maybe it was an animal that had fell and was stuck, or maybe it was my uncle who looked after the cattle. But this thing was sitting weird, basically like how Spider-Man perches over buildings, crouched down on top of a rock. I want to describe this thing. It was tall, skinny, and was wearing nothing. Just the body is what we could see, grayish color, and the head wasn't shaped like a human's head. It was thin and small. We were about 30 to 40 meters from the steam, and it was during the day too. As we were sitting there trying to figure out what we were seeing, the thing slowly stood up and my heart sank. Its arms were long, very long. I screamed to stop and instantly jumped from the front of the ATV to the driver, replacing my sister. 
as we were switching this thing started running at us but it was running weird its arms were swaying back and forth like normal runner but because of how long the arms were it looked weird you would think it would run on the long arms but it didn't and it was running fast I turned around and shot off straight through the field my sisters were screaming that it was still coming but to be honest I could not look back at this thing so I just said don't look at it we rounded the corner and that's the last we saw of it as we got home I crashed the ATV into the deck trying to get in as fast as we could we were so scared my parents actually believed us they called all the family to warn in case it was a trespasser they said nobody saw anything or anyone in the fields after that. Alex, Jim, and I decided to go camping. We set up camp, decided to just drink and talk, and that's what we did all night. About anything and everything that came to mind. It was 3 a.m. and we were still chatting away until we heard something in the trees. Some kind of cracking sound. Could be a bird, said Jim. A big damn bird, I replied with slight confusion. Could be a monkey, joked Alex. We shared a laugh and ignored the sound and continued to talk. Another half hour had passed and the sound had completely stopped. I wonder what that was anyway, Alex said. Well, I have no clue, I reply, taking a sip of my beer. Well, I hope it's gone, because I need a piss, Jim said, standing up and heading to the trees. A few minutes passed, and Alex and I grew concerned. We best go look for him said Alex. He sounded a little annoyed. We stood up and walked in the direction Jim went. It didn't take long to find the first drop of blood and then the trail that led deeper into the woods. What the fuck? I said, shaking. We began shouting for him, following the trail. I was the first to see him standing in a clearing about 10 meters away. He was facing away from us. We tried shouting, but we got no response. We walked closer and we noticed him twitching violently. He was covered in blood and clearly beat up. I was about to say his name once again, but the word got stuck in my throat when I saw the bloody pile of meat on the floor next to him. I think Alex saw it too, as he also went silent. As if by magic, Jim turned to us and we saw his face was literally hanging off and underneath was pale gray skin. We could also see a burning orange eye and part of a wide mouth with long, sharp teeth where the skin was peeled off. Besides from this, Jim looked normal, aside from a few cuts and bruises. As we stared into the single orange eye, the thing wearing Jim's skin pushed the peeling flesh back on, and there, Jim stood totally normal. Hey guys, let's go for a walk, he said in his normal voice. This thing also seemed to demonstrate excitement. Alex and I turned. We ran past our campsite and got straight in the car, parked about a mile from our tent. I'm not sure if this Jim followed us. I swear I could hear thumping footsteps behind Alex and I. We reached the car and jumped in, pouring sweat and heaving. I started the car faster than ever before and drove at nearly 100 miles per hour all the way back home. When we arrived and got out, I walked around the back of the car only to see scratch marks 
on the bumper. I shivered as I realized how close he must have been. This was over 40 years ago. Alex never quite recovered and last I heard he was living in a mental hospital. I was thinking I may have to join him as I'm pretty sure I saw Jen a few weeks ago at a bar. I thought I was mad until I did some research. I would have done it sooner but I'm an old man now and we didn't have Google back in the day. I'm pretty sure we encountered a skinwalker and it may have found me after 40 years and I think it wants to finish the job and now it's pretty strange that I keep getting letters asking to catch up from my old friend Jim hey everyone I'm a huge fan of all scary things and even the unexplained I even have my own YouTube channel where I post interviews that I have done with people who have experienced any sort of paranormal activity. However, there is one thing that I've always been, well, quite a skeptic about, and that is skinwalkers. I mean, witches who transform into animals and apparently are only confined to a specific area within America. To me it always sounded like the typical legends and stories about the boogeyman, you know, that parents tell you about. However, there are some events that have been happening that have actually made me doubt everything. And now I'm sharing this story so that you all can avoid what I did and also see if anyone out there can actually help me. My friend Zanny is of Navajo descent. He always shared cultural insights and stories of the rest with me. It was during one of our discussions over text that he first introduced me to the legends of the skinwalkers. He said something about shape-shifting humans. And with curiosity, I gladly accepted his invite to visit the res. Being a YouTuber or media creator, I plan to stay for a week hoping to go deeper into these stories, do some research, capture photos of notable sites, and gather first-hand accounts from the locals. The res was unlike any place I've been to. With its landscapes perfect for photos, it was both beautiful and eerie. Over the first few days, I kept finding myself busy from visiting the local trading post, hanging out at community events. I learned about their daily lives taking photos and setting up casual interviews with all sorts of people and the locals about these so-called skinwalkers. However, of course, the people of the rest met my questions about skinwalkers with different reactions. Some would actually cast their eyes downward, offering nothing more than a no comment. Others stared back with a stern look, warning me of the consequences of prying too deep into the things that are best left alone. Yet, yeah, a few brave souls did share stories about so-called coyotes who transform into humans. Apparently, they can mimic certain voices and animal sounds. How one should not whistle at night, as it's believed that this might actually invite or summon a skinwalker. So during my time there, I stayed in the hogan that belonged to Sani's grandma. But at the moment, nobody was staying in it, except for Sani. For those unfamiliar, a hogan is a traditional Navajo dwelling place constructed from a mixture of logs. There's actual some spiritual significance for the Navajo. It's almost like you can feel a connection to the land and the door to the hogan always faces east to greet the morning sun, which apparently is important in their daily rituals and traditions. After my string of interviews and questions on the res, Words seemed to have traveled fast. On the fifth day of my stay, I was outside the Hogan trying to capture photos of the beautiful sunset when I noticed an older man approaching. He moved with a slow pace and his clothing was traditional and around his neck were hanging all sorts of amulets that were making noise with each step that he took. 
Zanny, who had been inside the Hogan, stepped out and immediately went silent upon seeing this man. He whispered to me, That's Tahoma, one of the respected medicine men around these parts. Before I could ask more, Tahoma was already within earshot, his piercing eyes set deep and locked with mine. You're the one asking about those whom walk on all fours, he stated, more than ask. I hesitated for a moment, taken back by his statement. Uh, yeah, I am, I admit it, extending my hand in greeting. I'm just curious about the legends and he ignored my hand, cutting me off with a stern. Curiosity can lead to places from where there's no return. I felt a knot tighten in my stomach. I was trying to keep the conversation going. Hey, no disrespect. I'm just here to learn more about the culture and the stories. Tahoma stared deep into my eyes, as if he was studying my words. After what felt like an eternity, he spoke in a grave tone. There are things on this land that you don't understand, that you cannot comprehend, with your questions and your cameras. You awaken things best left, undisturbed. I gulp, the weight of his words pressing down on me. Hey man, I apologize if I offended or overstepped, I said. He leaned in closer, and with a hushed voice filled with urgency, he warned, leave this place. They have taken notice of you, and they don't like you watching them. With that, he turned and walked away, leaving behind the silence. My friend, looking as pale as I felt, said, When Tahoma speaks, we listen. I've been trying to tell you that these things are real, man. That night, the environment of the Hogan felt different, more ominous, if anything. Every small noise outside made me jump, and the once comfortable walls felt suffocating. I couldn't shake off the medicine man's warning, even though to be honest, I didn't believe him. Despite the tension that hung in the air that night, a part of me still doubted most of these things. I hadn't personally witnessed any evidence of skinwalkers, or the supernatural, during my stay so far. And stories and legends were one thing, but tangible proof was another thing. The medicine man's warning, a little scary I will admit, could just be a way to dissuade outsiders like me from prying too deep into Navajo traditions, I thought. I'm not gonna lie, that night, all the skinwalker talk had me a bit on edge. I guess the fact of being out here kinda didn't help. I had to use the restroom so I stepped out the Hogan and walked towards the dimly lit outhouse. As I was sitting down remembering that next time, to not indulge in other cultural foods so quickly, the distant sounds of the wilderness were interrupted by other noises that I started to hear, which were soft footsteps, the rustle of brush nearby, and the quiet creak of shifting dirt. It felt as if someone or something was slowly circling the outhouse, each footstep sounding closer than the last. Drawing in a silent breath, I waited, heart pounding, straining my eyes to see any trace of movement through the small cracks in the wooden structure, but I didn't see anything. Then, a tap at the door. Keep in mind this was around 11 at night, so I said out loud, Hey, I'm in here. No response. Then, I heard what sounded like, Perhaps a dog scampering away on all fours, with the running steps fading into the distance. Well, that was weird, I thought. As I finished up handling my business, I slowly unlatched the door and stepped out, cautiously scanning the darkness. I kid you not, as soon as I took two, three steps from behind me, I felt a force clamp down on my shoulder causing me to jump nearly out of my skin. That's when I turned around and I saw it. The face of Zanny with a roaring sound and then a loud laugh. Catching my breath and shaking my head, I said, well, all right, you got me, dude, I admit it. He started to laugh, 
throwing an arm around my shoulders as we began to walk back to the Hogan. You have to admit, he began, sweeping an arm out and pointing to the landscape. The rest is beautiful out here at night. Without the bright city lights, everything feels more alive, more connected. I took a moment to appreciate the beauty around us, the clear sky filled with numerous stars. It's beautiful out here, Sani, but I do want to let you know, it feels like we're the only ones out here. Some of these stories, legends, they just seem like traditions to be honest, passed down to make sure that everybody respects the land. He looked at me, then nodded. Well, that's fair. But some traditions are born from truth that has actually been forgotten, Sani said as we continue our walk back to the Hogan. On my last night at the res, I decided to indulge in a bit of mischief and to get back at Sani for the prank he pulled. While heading back from the outhouse again, I tiptoe around the Hogan, tapping gently on its walls and trying to mimic the eerie skinwalker sounds I heard they made. I was hoping that maybe Sani would start reciting a prayer that he told me that the people do whenever there's a skinwalker around. I was waiting to see if Sani came out when I noticed little bundles near the Hogan's base. With curiosity, I took out my phone and captured a few pictures, thinking it would add a unique touch to my video. And nearby, I saw stones fixed in a way that seemed to be a ritual circle. I moved a few rocks to get a better picture. Then, laughing quietly to myself and seeing that Sani was not reacting to this, I began to whistle. And then, in a mocking demonic voice, I called out, Sani, it is I who walk on all fours. There was only silence. And after about five more minutes, and seeing that he still wasn't coming, I decided to take some last final shots of the beautiful landscape as I knew this was my last night there. When I finally returned inside, Sani was there, snoring away. I chuckled to myself thinking, well, if a real skinwalker ever shows up, you'll be of no help with that deep sleep. The next morning I said bye to Sani and his grandma and thanked them for their hospitality. I also told Zanny I would contact him once I put a video together and that before publishing, I would send it to him to make sure he was okay with it. When I returned home to edit some of the videos and pictures, I noticed that something was off. In the background of many interviews were shadows flickering in and out of the frame. Even when I was trying to edit some of the interviews I had done, the audio itself sounded distorted with what sounded like whispering echoes behind the words of those whom I interviewed. However, it was the pictures that really disturbed me. Every single image that I had taken, even in the daylight, had a faint shadow figure growing more and more clear with each picture. And the most scary picture was the last few that I took after rearranging those stones. The picture was supposed to be of the landscape, but instead there was a blurry silhouette of what looked to be a person. It had elongated limbs and also a twisted, unnatural posture. Nervously, I contacted Zanny and after explaining everything, he went quiet saying that he would ask the local medicine man for advice. The next day, Sani called. His voice sounded worried. He told me I might have caught the attention of something and that he's communicating with Tahoma, the medicine man, to perform a ceremony. They believe it might help cleanse whatever I had caught the attention of. That same night, as I was asleep in my room, I was awoken by what sounded like whistling outside my window. I woke up half asleep, and I swear, I heard a voice coming from my closet, saying, I'm in here, mimicking my response that I gave when I was in the bathroom that night in the res. I'm posting this here because 
out of all the places on the internet, I figure this community might be the most understanding. If anyone knows what I can do to make things right, or how to protect myself, please let me know. I will provide an update tomorrow once Annie tells me how the ceremony went. But please, take this serious. I'm starting to panic as I'm typing this. And I swear, every time I glance at the dim reflection on my PC, when I change a window or tab, that distorted, twisted figure from that last photo I took seems to be standing right behind me.